Our next session, ladies and gentlemen, is the myths of India between memory and history with none other than author Devdutt Patnaik. A big round of applause. As you know, the stage gets set. We'll, the stage, you know, it'll be a conversation with consulting editor Sunday Standard, Mr. Ravi Shankar. And let's welcome them on stage with a huge round of applause. Mr. Devdutt Patnaik needs no introduction, a renowned mythologist, storyteller, speaker who bridges the gap between ancient wisdom and modern living. With his profound understanding of Indian mythology, he has reinterpreted the ancient epics and texts through contemporary lens. His captivating narratives provide both the readers and audience deeper insight into not only philosophy and spirituality, but also leadership, governance, and management. A popular figure in both literary and corporate circle, he has penned more than 50 books also dons the hat of a regular column writer in leading publication, a radio and TV show host, and a motivational speaker. So over to you, Mr. Ravi Shankar, for this wonderful session. Yes, the mo one of the most famous sons of Odisha and one of the most famous uh, sons of India. I'm very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Thank Patnaik you. On, on stage, Mr. Patnaik on stage. Okay, on Devdutt on stage. You consider the most, at least I do, the most authoritative um, mythologist, if the word like that exists. Uh, tell me something, why is uh, your, your mythology is very political? I mean, there is probably the only person, mythologist, who, who has such very strong political uh, nuances to your, 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 your work. Does it, does it, or has Odisha and Jagannath have anything to do with that? Well, I think uh, if you're Odia, everything is from Jagannath. So, uh, <laughs> see, I grew up in Bombay. So, I, although I'm Odia, I I really grew up in Bombay, and I I can speak Odia privately. I can't do public speaking in Odia. I can only speak Odia one to one, but public speaking <laughs> becomes difficult. But um, when you, I call myself a non-resident Odia because I don't stay here, but. We always had a Jagannath statue in my house. And from childhood, I would notice that if people from other states, when they would come, or my neighbors would come, they would never recognize this image. They would always say, kiska murti hai, ye kya hai, ye kahan se banaya hai. Then they wouldn't understand, but we'll say, ye Jagannath ji hai, ye Balabhadra hai. They wouldn't understand. But the moment I would say, puri Jagannath, they would understand it immediately. And I think from childhood, you realize how diverse India is. Um, you know, my neighbors were Jain, Telugu, Tamil, uh, Malayalam. So I'm grown up in a very cosmopolitan ecosystem in Bombay. And my parents brought Odisha to Bombay in a way. So uh, when you live in, as you grow older, and, you st and I started writing on mythology, the big thing for me was how complex Indian mythology is. And it's extremely complex. The mythology of Odisha is very different from the mythology of Kerala, is different. And then in the last 10, 15 years, you saw the mythology of Delhi appearing and a Hindi mythology appearing. And I was like, but that's one mythology of India. It's not the mythology of India. So I suddenly realized how stories are political. You cannot talk about Katha without talking about politics and economics. So politics, economics, philosophy, all that is part. So when you study the goddesses, Lakshmi, Durga, Saraswati. So Lakshmi is economics, Durga is politics, Saraswati is philosophy. And these are the three goddesses of India. So you cannot talk about anything in this world without referring to its political aspects, its economic aspects, its philosophical aspects. We try to divorce them, you know, state should be separate from religion. All these kind of ideas are, don't exist in the real world. In the real world, they all, you know, you can't read Ramayana Mahabharata, you can't go to the temple of Jagannath without discussing politics, without discussing economics, without discussing philosophy. So for me, this always be the same. There's no difference as such. No, Jagannath. Uh, it's an incomplete and physical form. Uh, how does it um, how does it represent uh, Hinduism or the Odia uh, concept of I don't know the Odia concept of Hinduism? But I mean, how does it represent Hinduism? No, there is. You can say the Odia concept of Hinduism. The, the thing is, 
Hinduism is like, you know, when you're cooking and you have, a, let's say, salt, and you put it in different dishes, it manifests differently. The salt with tomato tastes different. Salt with potato tastes different. Incidentally, in Odia, tomato is called bilaiti bangan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's something that to remind us that tomato is not an Indian dish. Okay. Um, so every, there are a lot of foreign ideas that have come to India, including tomatoes mm. and potatoes. And the thing is, uh, when you look at a local manifestation of a religion, so Hinduism in Kerala manifests very differently than what and manifests in Odisha. What manifests in a coastal Odisha would be very different from what happens in the western side of Odisha. Maharashtra has a very different Hinduism. So, um, uh, How you would know, you elaborate on that? Uh, so if you go to, if I'm speaking to a Marathi audience, I've, if I say Jagannath Puri, they will have a very this, they will know it is a Hindu shrine, but they won't connect emotionally the way if I say Pandurang or uh, Vithal of Pandarpur. And if I talk about Varkaris, if I talk about the Marathi poetry, the audience will immediately get it. They'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you go to Gujarat or Rajasthan, you talk about Srinathji, they'll immediately understand it. But if you t I have been to Srinathji temple and I remember this gentleman and I know that Vallabhacharya's rituals in Srinathji temple are based on the Puri temple. He came to Puri, he saw the how the temple rituals were performed and he took it and he made it part of the Pushti Marg. So I told the guy, ki, you know, many of these rituals that you see in the temple come from Odisha. He got very upset. He says, nahi, 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 hamara sab original hai. You know? So everybody says it's original. If I come to Odisha and I'll, you know, I remember when I was talking to the temples and we were talking about the Kalinga architecture, I said, well, there is a lot of similarity with South India. Then somebody from Odisha will say, no, 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 it's original to Odisha. If you go to Kerala and you say that, you know, the temple design is influenced by Chinese structures, they will get very upset. They'll say, no, 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 Kerala influenced China. China didn't influence Kerala. So I think every part of our country has its own expression of mythology, of stories, Ramayana, Mahabharata, everything. That local flavor is what makes it magical. But being a Malayali, I don't think the Chinese did influence the temples at all because I think it, even much, much before Huyen Sang, the Malayali temple architecture was around. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But we're talking about originality. And I think this is going to be a slightly long question. The answer can be equally long. Um, you know, if you look at the, the, the when Christianity advances, um, and it was a military advance before a cultural advance, a lot of the deities of ancient Greece were taken over and converted into saints and you know so they, many of the, the, um, the gods of the Christians, the gods of the, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, they all became yeah. you know saints and those who refused became demons. So the daemon, the word daemon comes from that. Now if you look at the original, again, again jumping, I uh, met a shaman you know called the Mantravadi in Kerala, very, very learned man called Katumada Narayani Nambudripat. And in the course of the conversation, he said, listen, I am not an Aryan Brahmin. I am a Dravidian Brahmin because the gods of worship are Dravidian gods. But many of the, uh, the, 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 the mantras, they chant, are also have Sanskritic words. So what is original? What is not original? Is this, has the Aryan influence uh, taken over like the, Greek, the, the Christians did to the Greeks, original gods? And how do they, how do you explain the, the underlying mythology of the overarching Hindu mythology? Um, so, uh, you know, it's very difficult when people say, what is original? So I was just told you about Vilaiti Bangan, right? Tomato. So if you cook a dish in tomato, with tomato, is it an Indian dish or a foreign dish? For example, a samosa contains potato and it, the samosa was designed by, is, is basically sambosa which is a Turkish dish and it used to contain meat. So it was non-vegetarian originally and it came with the sultans and in India the people didn't want to eat, then they started putting peas in it and then they started putting potato. Now potato came with the Portuguese, chilies came with the Portuguese. So, what? But if you tell me that a batata vada is not an Indian dish, 
because batata is not from India, that's an absurd sentence. If somebody tells me that, you know, uh, so a, a society has ideas coming from different places. There is nothing original as such. If, if you want to say what is the original, 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 then originally we were all from Africa. And we all came from Africa along the coasts. And so you see ideas exchanging, evolving, transforming over time. So if somebody asks me, Aryan idea, I say, what is Aryan idea? Tell me. Because the, when we tell, have they read the Rig Veda's idea is very different from the Atharva Veda idea. When you read the mantras, they are very different from the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas are very different from the Upanishads. All Vedic literature that we have really originate in the Gangetic Plains. And then they gradually start moving south. But when we talk about Shiva's marriage to Parvati, this is not there in the Vedas. In the Upanishad, there is one mention of Uma. So there is, where did this idea come of Vishnu sleeping on a serpent? Where did this idea? It's not there in the Vedas. Where are these ideas coming from? The idea of the goddess so powerful, Durga, is not there in the Vedas. The Durga Sukta which is told is basically for Agni. It is not for the Durga that we know now. So the stories change. And we know that all these rishis came down, Agastyamani, Dirghatama, Odisha uh, with Dirghatama, as per Mahabharata, Dirghatama Rishi comes down, meets an Asura called Bali, and through the, his wife produces a son. One of the sons' name is Kalinga. And therefore, the Kalingalik. That's one story which comes in the Mahabharata. So, you keep having this. This words, we have to know there is a northern idea, there are southern ideas, there are eastern ideas, there are western ideas. The big idea which came, for example, from Odisha um, is, uh, you know, the tantric ideas came from in, uh, Odisha big way. The, you know, there's a professor here, Umakant Mishra, who writes about it. You have the Vajrayana Buddhism, which is called, perhaps, one of the nodal centers of Vajrayana Buddhism is Odisha. And because it is connected to Indonesia, where you see the Borbadur te uh, uh, temple, the design, you'll find similar designs only in Odisha, nowhere else. I see. So, now did Borbadur, now if you go to Indonesia and you ask them, and you say it's an Indian idea, they will get very upset. The Indonesians will say, no, no, no it is our idea. So, everybody wants their local idea to be, is indigenous. If now, if it is 1,000 years old, 100 years old, 2,000 years old, which is original? 2,000, 1,500, how old? Like, if you ask people how old is Jagannath Temple, they'll say forever, it has always been around. You ask a historian, he will say it starts in 12th century, 11th century, 10th century, and they'll arguments. But if you ask an odd man, he'll say, jab se Odisha hai, tab se Jagannath hai. Now, who is right? <laughs> now, who is right? So. History ke space mein history and local space. So if the person says these are original Dravidian gods, believe him. I don't want to argue with him. I'll say, yeah, yeah, very good, good for you. you know, Kantara, when people saw Pantara, the entire Hindi-speaking belt say, yeh varaha avatar hai. And I remember somebody was trying to, for some reason, taking my name. And I'm like, that is a Bhutakola. I, I mean, I, I know Bhutakola for years. Everybody knows what's a Bhutakola. If you live in... Bombay, you're familiar with Tulu-speaking people. I said, you have never seen a Bhutakola in your life, and now you look at the, because it is a Varaha or a wild boar form, they thought it is Varaha Avatar or Vishnu. I said, there's no connection. But now you want to call it Vishnu Avatar, okay, chalo. The song also in the picture, it says Varaha Rupam. Because that is how he will get the Hindi audience, no? Okay, I've been following your tweets. I mean, I obviously follow you. Uh, I find your views interesting. Uh, one of the things which you keep kind of, you know, the majority of Indians are non-vegetarians, according to uh, all census data. But uh, you seem to uh, say that today the Hindu is identified as a vegetarian more than a non-vegetarian. That's the point you keep making politically. Would you care to elaborate on that? Sorry? Would you care to elaborate on that? See, diet, vegetarian. So, um, so... As an Odia, you know, I love my non-vegetarian food. <laughs> I mean, so do I. <laughs> so, uh, so it's, I always tell people when my mother, if I have to tell someone I'm vegetarian, how do you, how would I, my mother say it or how will I say it? Sadha khana. Simple food. Hmm. It is not pure food. Swachha khana, shuddha khana nahi. Sadha khana. 
so really vegetarian food emerges from being simple now simple and pure have very different meanings simple means humility purity means arrogance so pure vegetarian and simple vegetarian are very different <laughs> <laughs> Pure vegetarian is saying you are impure. Simple vegetarian is saying I am trying to be simple. I want to simplify my life. That is the original meaning of vegetarian. I want to be simple. So I don't want to eat rajakiya khana, ghee, spices, mutton, alcohol, fish. I don't want to eat rajakiya khana. I don't want to eat unhealthy food. I don't want to drink alcohol. So that is tamasic or leftover food. I want to eat simple, fresh, easily available food. This has become a point for the, you know, what is called um, ahankar ko ahuti, feeding the ego. Mm -hmm. That I am special and I am better than you because I am eating vegetables. Basically, I say you have vitamin B12 deficiency. <laughs> and, you know, people really get upset when I say, but you know, ghee is animal fat. Ghee is animal fat. And yesterday somebody said, Everybody how learned. dare you call ghee animal fat? But it is, it is animal fat. It's basic chemistry. But they get very upset by this because they call themselves vegetarian. Then they will say, no, 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 but milk is produced non-violently. So then I said, eggs are also produced non-violently. And the egg from the chicken... I said the poor cow is being made, you know, poor cow has to be, is be forced to be pregnant and produce milk, which you know, every day you're taking milk out of her. The chicken can produce eggs without getting married. <laughs> so it's purer, no, it's purer. It is like <laughs> Brahmacharini. So uh, now that gets, they're very upset because the logic doesn't work, right? Because they are not interested in being simple. They're interested in being superior. And that is why they use the word pure. Okay. Now, when you go to the Jagannath temple, Jagannath temple is a Vaishnav temple. It is pure vegetarian, pure, pure, pure. But his mother, Bimala, you have to give her uh, a blood yeah. sacrifice. Yes. How you do it, that's a big issue. People say, don't do it in the temple, do it outside. But the goddesses, the Thakuranis of Odisha are very clear. Don't give us blood, there'll be blood in your house. <laughs> So the Thakurani culture of Odisha, if you deny it just because some Hindi-speaking priest is saying that it should not be done, you will not save Odisha. No, Delhi doesn't save Odisha. Odisha saves itself. <laughs> so, you're, so you're talking about language imperialism in mythology. Well, see, language. Peggy spoke about language. Stories, costumes, habits, foods. Everything is different in India. When people ask me to explain India, I said, please look at the currency note. U.S. dollar bill has only one or two languages, English and Latin. Euro does not have so many. India has so many languages. I mean, how many, most Indians don't know that Odisha is the first linguistic state. We are the first linguistic state. After, in, before independence. After independence, Andhra Pradesh became a linguistic state. Now it is split into two. Right? Andhra Pradesh, which is a linguistic state, split into two. Because they couldn't live together. No? Telangana is different from Andhra. Odisha, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I, but know, language is an extremely complex issue. Stories are a complex issue. You can't understand the culture without stories, language, food, rituals, history, geography. The fact that Odisha has a river civilization with lots of rivers is the reason it, and it, it's, it's located relatively isolated. From the north, you can't enter easily because Bengal, after Bengal, it's very difficult to enter in Odisha. Uh, you have to go all around the Deccan Plateau and then from Andhra Pradesh enter Odisha. So that's where Od Odisha has had a unique culture. It's relatively isolated, relatively, not completely. Therefore, it, you know, many people don't know it's many practices over here, older practices. They're trading with Southeast Asia. If you go to Bali, uh, or you go to Indonesia, or you go to Thailand, you see, you go there and you think, sounds like Odia, it sounds like Odia. <laughs> you know, the script yeah. looks like Odia. So these things are culture. You know, you know, the geographical power of a god is not always understood very clearly. So you have Guru Varapin in Kerala, who is the most dominant deity, though there are others too. You have Murugan in, uh, in, in, in Tamil Nadu. 
you have Kali uh, in Bengal, uh, and you have Jai Jagannath, Jagannath in Odisha. So, and Jagannath is, is Krishna, in, in, if I say understand it, or is a part of Krishna, or is Bhava Krishna, I, 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 am, I am completely illiterate when it comes to Jagannath. Would you like to kind of tell me why is Jagannath so much part of Odisha? Well, um, there are two or three temples in India which define geography. Now, this locating a geography with a temple is found, for example, I'll give an example. If you go to Kaveri River Delta, it is the Srirangam temple which defines the, that local Tamil landscape. So, Kaveri River has three islands. Each of them has Ranganatha Swami temple, Sri Ranga Swami temple. So, one is there in Karnataka, what there is in Tamil Nadu is the famous Sri Rangam temple. But it is also in Karnataka. So, the whole Kaveri River is shaped by Sri Ranganatha, Ranganatha Swami, the sleeping Vishnu. So, the geography is defined by the temple. If you go to Maharashtra, you will see the geography emerging, what is called Maharashtra Dharma, emerging around Pandharpur Vithal temple, which is not a very big temple, it's a very tiny, very small temple compared to Sri Rangam, compared to Jagannath Puri, which is a big, massive temples. Odisha's uh, Jagannath temple uh, becomes, the thing is, it should never be under a king's control completely. And all these temples are built by local people and then the king supports it. So the king plays an outside role. Is that why Modi said Jai Jagannath instead of uh, Jai Shri Ram? <laughs> well, <laughs> see, you, if you believe in tradition, you should respect tradition. Divinity without the feminine form is incomplete in Hinduism. You cannot have Jagannath temple without the presence of Subhadra, without the presence of Lakshmi, without the presence of Mangala, without the presence of Bimala, without the goddesses. When you try to create a Hinduism where goddesses don't exist, Ram is without Sita, Krishna is without Radha, there's more Arjun than Radha for some weird reason. There is Shiva without Parvati. These are not auspicious. It's Ashub. Goddess has to be present. You cannot enter Puri without going to Bata Mangala, which is the goddess of the road, because there are Mangalas, you know. You have to respect the goddess, not as a token. It's not like a banana or a coconut that you keep there. It is power. So, I find, you know, these ideas that when you talk about Jagannath and, you know, Jagannath's form is so amorphous, but you talk of male gods, female gods, you're, you're raising issues of gender. You know, Odisha has a very famous uh, scripture called Lakshmi Puran, where if the goddess is not acknowledged and respected, you will not get food. Even the god has to eat burnt food. These are very powerful ideas which people don't understand. They talk about Hinduism, 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 but they don't understand what is unique. When Buddhism comes, Buddhism is about a prince who walks away from his wife. What is Hinduism? It is about a Shiva who has to marry Shakti. So one, the householder becomes a hermit. That is Buddhism. Jainism, householder becomes a hermit. What is Hinduism? Shiva will become Uma Maheshwara. Gauri Shankara, which is the hermit becomes a householder. He has to get married. He has to produce children. So that is the foundational difference. Buddhism, Jainism is about monastic orders until they became tantric. But when you say Buddha, you don't see a dampatya. There is no Yashodhara anywhere. So the, the singularity is there. But the moment you talk about Hinduism, you cannot talk about Shiva without Shakti. You cannot have a Ratha Yatra without the story of how, you know, Lakshmi has a fight with him and then, of course, the famous Rasgulla has to come for her. Well, These I think two... the Bengalis claim Rasgulla, <laughs> Odi has claimed Rasgulla. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, uh, the fact that there is a story about a god with a goddess, Ramayan is not there without Sita, Mahabharat needs a Draupadi, Krishna needs a Radha, Rukmini, Satyabhama. You know, so the fact that the goddess is present is missing in the current. It's vegetarian celibate men. How boring, huh? It's terribly boring. <laughs> no alankar. No alankar. Everybody is wearing some geruavastra. 
there is no there is no there is no shringar there is no madhurya there is no lasya making an anti hindu by the way <laughs> no it is not this is hinduism this is sanatana dharma incomplete it is incomplete knowledge is incomplete knowledge to get the goddess in and see how much prosperity will come to our country they have systematically kept the goddess out they have systematically kept and i can show you ritually what have they done wrong if you want to talk agama shastras you want to talk rituals and talk properly rituals you cannot do a puja without ardhangini sitting next to you you cannot do a yagya even ram could not do a yagya without the golden image of sita so the marriage they are not telling marriage they're saying engagement enjoy the world life is beautiful shiva is does nataraja dance only because parvati is in his life na otherwise he's sitting there boring on top of a mountain <laughs> come down the ganga river will start to flow the ocean will be churned lakshmi will emerge 14 jewels will emerge the apsaras will come so you're talking about a very chaotic beauty of hinduism um so you 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 do you think that this there is a cultural and religious homogenization of hinduism which is it uh, is an attempt it is like trying to say the the national dish of india will become puri bhaji you can't have that i mean people will rebel you can't say that you, you know that is the wonderful thing the odisha temple will have its own rules every god will have their own food if you want to have a veg sadha gods will have sadha food rajasik gods will have raj there will be tamasik gods also there will be chamundas there will be uh, you know all kinds of goddesses you go to the chausashta yogini temple in bhubaneswar 10 kilometers from here you will see the goddesses dancing screaming loving blood loving fish loving meat and being also same time delicate demure kind they they are all spectrum so how does this happen i mean how does this how is this change happen see when you get very impressed by western people you start thinking i want to be like a jesuit missionary jesuit missionaries did not get married and that's your role model you somehow believe that celibate men are better than normal people okay once you start believing that holiness comes with celibacy then you'll reject women you'll reject life you'll reject fun even shiva is told please shaadi karo no being single doesn't mean being celibate by the way no no in this i'm very very clear what i mean either educated and you know, <laughs> a lot of adults in the room so the point is it's about bhog vilas look at the temple architecture the devadasi is once danced now they have been wiped out the culture has been wiped out why because they were independent women who didn't marry there is also sexual feudal exploitation well, that's a standard marxist argument acha okay <laughs> independent women are always exploited <laughs> so i mean are you saying we should bring the devdasi system back well any independent woman is called what in indian society you tell me yeah you tell me <laughs> we don't like independent women we'll say they'll be exploited by men it's a clever way to say, how did they solve the devadasi problem get her married to a man and let the man own her property uh, devadasi is owned independent property they had their own property they could have their own lovers they transmitted wealth through daughters all rights were taken away in the name of rescuing them from slavery so basically to rescue you you have to marry a man take his surname and give your property to him is that it, doesn't sound correct correct absolutely agree with you but does did is it a post colonial phenomenon or is it no, a pre colonial no it's everywhere because they were rich women you know i remember my mother telling me the story her elder sister was much older and she lived in katak and she got married to a very rich family and you know those typical stories of becoming poor and all that she said my, my i have a memory that when my eldest sister came home she wore so much gold and she came in a palki that the people thought devadasis are coming because gold was associated with dev either you are a queen a maharani or you are a devadasi maharani needs the king or maharaja to give a gold devadasi doesn't need anyone jagannath is enough so the brides of jagannath so wealth these women if you read buddhist literature half the donations were done by the ganikas the donations amrapali they were rich women who didn't marry and who passed on wealth and knowledge to their daughters 
I know this practice exists even today in Maharashtra, in certain communities. But marriage is mandatory, right, for property. And until about 50 years ago, women they were not allowed to own property. All property had to be a man's name. The British believe women should not own property. So Devadasis obviously have to be kicked out. So we don't understand these concepts. India has had all kinds of polygamy, polyandry, celibate men, celibate women, monks, none, all kinds of variety. Now you're trying to homogenize everything, like vanilla ice cream. But we like our tutti frutti. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want vanilla ice cream. Keep it in North India. That's okay. I, uh, deviating from that, I'm, I read that uh, the, your, your book, uh, that you say the Mahabharata and the Ramayana are the same story. I mean, it's, uh, am I right? Yeah, I, I've just published a book. Uh, it's translated in Marathi, uh, in Odia, sorry. I, <laughs> um, uh, so it's uh, translated in Odia. It's, I compare Ramayana and Mahabharata, and many people uh, don't realize that Ramayana and Mahabharata uh, are really the same story. If you look at Ramayana and Mahabharata structurally, the first part of the Ramayana is palace politics. The first part of the Mahabharata is palace politics. The second part of Ramayana is forest exile. So from palace, you go to the Vanavasa. So Ramayana has Vanavasa, Mahabharata has Vanavasa. After Vanavasa, you have a Mahayuddha. So Ramayana has Mahayuddha, Mahabharata has Yuddha. And after the story doesn't end with a war, it ends with the tragedy of war. Mahabharata has the tragedy of war, Ramayana has the tragedy of war. So Ram dies alone, Krishna dies alone. So at the end of Ramayana, at the end of Mahabharata, the avatars are alone. And the loneliness of God, that they are constantly lonely. Like Ram can be the great king of Ayodhya, but he, can, he knows his wife is innocent, but the rules of society will force him to live separately from her. Krishna will be the greatest Purushottama on earth, but he cannot stop a war. He cannot stop Pandavas and Kauravas from fighting, no matter how powerful he is. This is telling the avatar is not all powerful. And to tell that no human being is all powerful. Ram is not all powerful. Krishna is not all powerful. This is what the Ramayana and Mahabharata were written to tell the Rajas. Ki Ram and Krishna could not solve. Don't try to think you are smarter than them. But we don't listen. We read the Ramayana and Mahabharata. We try to tell the Ramayana story without Sita. We try to tell the Mahabharata story without the Draupadi. Without understanding these stories, we don't understand, you know. And that is what I wanted people to appreciate, that these stories were written to communicate very, very complex ideas. They explain karma, they explain dharma, they explain artha, they explain shringara. Everything is explained in this through storytelling. And if you compare Ramayana and Mahabharata, you suddenly see a magical world, a completely different world. Why is Parshuram there in both the epics? Hanuman. Hanuman is there in both the epics. So they're trying to connect the two. And you know, there's a, you know, the famous story of, um, you know, why does Ram take birth as Krishna? And the story goes that Laksh uh, one day Lakshman comes to Ram and says that, you know, you are the elder brother, therefore I have to obey you all the time. So Ram says, in my next life, I'll be your younger brother, but you will still listen to me. So Balaram will always listen to Krishna because Krishna has charm. He said, you don't need power and position to get your way. You can also use charm. So Krishna doesn't have power or position. He is in, like there's an Odia song which is called Adhama Jati. He's like a, he's just there. He's like a cowherd, but he can just get everybody to dance around his fingers. This is a political statement. You're talking about politics. Ram is the prince and Krishna is the cowherd. If this is not politics, and both Ram can manage, Ram is helpless, Krishna is helpless. Ram gets people to obey through rules, Krishna gets people to obey through charm. So you suddenly realize, God gives, if you're a prince, you cannot do Rasalila. And if you are a cowherd, <laughs> you will never have Patta Bhishekha. So everybody has limits, and that's what the Ramayana and Mahabharata are telling. Even God, when he becomes Avatarana, is bound by limits. That is Ramayana and Mahabharata. The humanization of God, basically. It is the humanization of God. No, it is the humanization of Divinity. what it means for an infinite being to live in a finite world. That is called Avatarana. You may be the smartest person on earth, but you have to live in a world full of stupid people. 
what will you do you think you will make them smart you won't they will make you stupid <laughs> and you have to be kind and forgive them that is what they're telling ram is being vishnu is being brought down and ramayan is telling that even on earth you will not be living happily with sita krishna comes and says i'll stop all war i'll say no you can't stop a war they'll kill each other they'll drink blood they'll abuse women in public in krishna no matter what how much of a 700 bhagavad gita is told at the end of the day arjun will come and tell you that i forgot what you told me <laughs> and you have the anu gita which is written in anushasana parva which is a repeat of the gita which most people don't know they know about the bhagavad gita they don't know about the anu gita where krishna arjun goes to krishna and says i forgot what you told me before the war can you please repeat and krishna gets very angry and tells him how can i repeat what was told in a state of ecstasy in yoga state in a yogic state but you see these are stories of what happens to human beings even god is helpless before human beings it is only there in hinduism now this looks as if there are many narrators of the same story right yeah I mean, it can't be just one person it doesn't no, the, seem like one person no the, I, what i'm telling you is not a version these are the structural person one person it doesn't seem like one person has written the whole thing because no, no, it's, so a, many... it's a collective writing these things have been written by over centuries by different people for example uh, you have the mahabharat in odisha which is written by sarala das uh, you have the mahabharat uh, you uh, you have the uh, ramayana and mahabharat written every part of india by different people and each one has given it a local flavor each one changes the story a lot so there are different ramayans in different parts of india the broad structure remains the same the broad story remains the same but what we call alankar changes the alankar changes the jewelry changes the costume changes the actors don't change and that's where the magic happens see ram as we understand it today i mean the ram the political ram the ram of ayodhya the current ram of ayodhya the, the, and that's that's where you know what i mean the ram and the ram temple of ayodhya how Uh, i mean i don't really know the number i hear that there are many ramayans 100 yeah. ramayans how is he different from all the other ram so does he unite them in an identity no see these are political narratives which you know politician you know somewhere somebody has made a mistake that i keep telling people that politicians are not very intelligent people most politicians begin their career in a very strange place and usually it is not the school but we are going to politicians and asking them academic questions have you ever seen a tv channel calling a professor because professors are not interesting na boring hai they'll give you facts you need drama either get an actor or get a politician there is no difference that's what they do if you listen to a politician telling you rama and then you really need bhakti because it is the end of gyana yoga it is the end of karma yoga it is the end of yoga it is some bizarre thing that you are doing read the books the stories are very powerful each story the the uh, ramayana changes dramatically uh, valmiki ramayana it, it does not have what is called the bhakti rasa it is written in a very different sanskrit by the time it comes 500 years ago bhakti movement becomes very big and bhakti movement is at a time when india is going through a lot of chaos structures are changing dramatically politically things are changing everybody is scared you know when people talk about sufism and islam when does sufism become popular it becomes only popular after the mongol invasion and the destruction of baghdad when baghdad was destroyed by the mongols the islamic world couldn't believe it and that is when sufi traditions began it became popular it was there somewhere it was there in some small places but it was not important in the same way in india bhakti was always there it is not like you find bhakti words like shraddha in vedas also but it becomes the most important thing around 500 years ago when india is going through a political turmoil new ideas are coming temples are being destroyed new thoughts are coming uh, and you suddenly have this idea that bhagwan has to be nirguna because all the saguna temples are being destroyed so how do you create god you have a nirguna god you imagine a god through music so bhakti comes through music and therefore ramayana and ramcharitmanas which is hindi belt things is valmiki ramayana it's not it's a different ramayana it is poetic it's poetry because bhakti always comes from poetry and if you go to indonesia and you see the ramayana over there it has no poetry 
It is no music. There is no bhakti over there. So Indonesia Ramayana, people say it's the same Ramayana. It's not the right. Go and, go and watch a Thai Ramayana. Go and watch a Cambodian Ramayana. You will say the story is similar, but I'm not feeling anything. There's no rasa. There is no bhava. There is no Natya Shastra there. They're performing. It's beautiful, but it is not creating bhakti. Because that traveled thousand years before. What we are experiencing is 500 years old. So it's an older form. So it doesn't have that bhakti magic which is there in India. So stories change, ideas change. This idea of bhakti becomes very powerful in the last 500 years. In Ramayana Mahabharata, when they composed, dharma was a bigger issue. The establishment of royal order because kings were emerging, the new Raja Mandalas were emerging. So Chanakya is writing at that time, you have Manusmriti being written at that time, the whole idea of social order, what is a good king? So Ramayana and Mahabharata are trying to say, Ram is born in a royal family and he'll be a good king. Mahabharata says, how does Krishna coach a Yudhishthira to become a great king? So it's one is about a king, the other is about a king maker. Bhakti is not important in the old versions because dharma is important. In the new versions, Bhakti becomes important. You talk about a Hanuman who has all the power in the world but has no ambition. Is it possible for a man with all the power, Ashtasiddhi, Navanidhi, he has everything but he has no ambition. He has no ambition and then he helps Ram and everybody says, I always ask people, what is Ram, uh, Hanuman's ambition? And says, it is to serve Ram. That's I not said, true. But if it is to serve Ram, please understand the karmic. If I serve Ram, Ram is in my debt. Which means if you are in my debt, you will go to Narak. So Hanuman is never going to do something by which Ram will go to Narak. He cannot give something. If I give something to you, you are in my debt. If you are in debt and you don't repay me, you will go down to Narak. So the whole idea of Seva is embedded in the karmic theories. Now these ideas people don't discuss. They only want to say, basically everybody says, I want a Hanuman in my team, but I don't want to be Ram. He says, the Ravanas of the world, who after seeing Hanuman says, I wish he was my team. But right. then Ravan, Hanuman will burn Lanka. And that is what is important. Ravan may be a Brahmin, may be educated in the Vedas, but he doesn't recognize that Hanuman is Shiva, he is Rudra. And he's come to his house. Hanuman, who, Ravan, who could not bring Kailasa mountain to the south, Shiva comes his, to his house, but what does he do? He burns his tail. This is what Ravanas do. They burn Hanuman's tail. Ravan separates Ram and Sita. Hanuman brings Ram and Sita together. We have to decide whether we want to be a Sanskrit scholar like Ravan or a Sanskrit scholar like Hanuman. That is, uh, that's an interesting binary. It is Hanuman <laughs> versus Ravan more, uh, more than Ram versus Ravan. It's always, both a, uh, one is a Shiv Bhakt and one is Shiva himself. You know, uh, it's it's amazing. I mean, you you you're a, you're a fount of knowledge, and um, but I see that you're um, you in the modern context. I mean, I, no contemporary context. Yeah, she'll come and you know make make a noise. <laughs> so in the in the contemporary context, uh, you seem like a disruptionist. You know, I mean, you're a disruptionist uh, in, when you go to again the the, the normal mores of society <laughs> and uh, the Hindu narrative. See, when people have a substandard understanding of Hinduism, when an Odia scholar comes in, they get nervous and they say it is disruption. The fact that I, I always remind people that I come from Odisha, I was raised in Maharashtra, I was trained in, I speak Marathi and Odia. So you see the diversity of India. So disruption, it's like what has happened to the West, right? The moment they started diversity and inclusion, they got nervous and they collapsed. Because diversity is very difficult to swallow. So I'm not disrupting, I'm making people aware that there's infinity out there. Your knowledge is very limited. Can we go towards from, towards Ananta? Which is, the name of God in Hinduism is Ananta, infinity, Ananta Vasudeva. There's a temple here in Bhubaneswar. Ananta Vasudeva. Infinity. Don't try to contain it with an avatar, with a avatar. Don't try to contain it within a gender. Don't try to contain it within a practice like celibacy or vegetarianism. You're destroying it. 
So it's not, wisdom is always scary. Because if it doesn't scare you, that means you are in your egg. And you are not, a, when a chicken has to come out of its egg, it is a very violent process. It has to break that egg. You know, that's how you break the chicken's egg. Because they don't eat eggs, they don't understand these processes. But we are all this little brahmanda, we are all in this little egg. We need the strength to break that egg shell. And Saraswati is the way to do it. And Saraswati will come with Vigyana Bhairava. She'll frighten you. Because knowledge, Vigyana is bhai, Bhaya, so Bhairava. Knowledge always, good knowledge has to frighten you. It has to make you nervous. Because you suddenly realize what you don't know and the unknown is always scary. So I don't, dis, I am, I don't do anything. I'm just telling you what the scriptures are telling you which you have not read. And that's frightening. But what you're saying is what we have read is not what, today, what has been written originally. But that about, you know, this is very, very personal opinion is that I, I genuinely believe that India is essentially Hindu. I don't mean in the political sense. Yeah, yeah, I know totally. And because, you know, you have Guru Arapan who is Krishna. And Guru Arapan, um, similarly, you have Jagannath who is Krishna. Um, you have, uh, I mean, yeah. there's so many, like Vaishnu Devi, I'm sorry, but it, it's new, uh, who is uh, uh, the, the, the mother. So you, you just, as you were saying, just reduce it to the binaries of the male and the Yeah, they reduce form. everything. Yeah. Right. So how do you see Hinduism? What is what for you is Hinduism? So the first, I mean the simplest way to understand is to understand hunger, bhook. We are all, all living organisms are hungry. And in order to eat, I have, when I eat, I eat someone or something. And as long as you eat, you are in debt. Dharma is when you get others to eat, when you give food to others. To feed the other is dharma. And as long as you don't feed other people, you will be trapped in samsara. So Buddha is telling, outgrow hunger. I don't want to be hungry, but the Hindus are saying, that's not enough. You may outgrow hunger, but you have to think of other people's hunger. Hunger is such an important part of Hinduism. That's why food is such an important part of Hinduism, bhoga. That is why in Jagannath temple it is all about food, food, food. You have to feed others. Your whole life is about being a mango tree and producing mangoes to feed others. Only when you feed others will the world happen. And I think that's the whole, it's about feeding, bhoga. It's naivedya. You give naivedya to God to get prasad. You can't get prasad without Naivedya. In business language it is, unless you invest, you won't get return on investment. Today we live in a world where we want return on investment without investment. We want prasad without Naivedya. Now that's disastrous because we'll be in debt and that will create Narak. And we are in Narak. So how did you become the face of, uh, as a modern or, or uh, the Patnaik brand of my Hindu mythology, how did you become the face of it? How did you travel from management to this? Well, um, I'm sorry, I'm very conscious of time, so Kaveri... Uh, no, 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 that she will come and you know, okay. <laughs> make noise. So Kaveri is just waving at us. So, uh, <laughs> but we'll have to wind up now. Yeah, we'll wind but, up. But uh, uh, the point is, I'll, I'll conclude if you don't mind. It's, Absolutely. Is that, um, you see, I think uh, my journey is because I did not see mythology as a subject. I saw mythology as a way to understand the human mind. And for me, mythology is the map of the human mind. Christian mythology, Islamic mythology, Aborigin mythology, you know, tribal mythology, Chinese mythology, Japanese. Oh, I study all the mythologies. But to make money, I focus on Hindu mythology. <laughs> <laughs> so Jai Jagannath and thank you so much thank for a so wonderful session.